This video is brought to you by Squarespace. This week, I challenged myself to paint up the brand new Marvel Crisis Protocol core set in 24 hours over the course of a single week. Using no airbrush, no speed paints, not even any spray cans. And just to be different, I decided to paint up the entire set, terrain included, in a Warhammer-inspired grimdark style. On the first day I received this box in the mail, huge thank you, by the way, to Atomic Mass Games for sending me this early review copy, I just opened it up and took a look at everything inside. And as someone who bought the original core set a little bit earlier this year, I have to say this box does seem like a huge upgrade. You get a ton more stuff in this box, 13 character models instead of 10, and almost twice the amount of terrain as the original. The character models themselves are also a huge upgrade from the original core set, which was released four years ago. Those original models were good, but a few of them have some really small pieces that I found a bit challenging to assemble, whereas with these new ones, I found them much easier to assemble, I had no issues with them, and I was able to put everything together in about 14 hours over the course of three days without even needing the instructions. And here's what everything looks like together once it's assembled. Most of the train is reused from older kits, but all of the character models are brand new, which is really great as a lot of these characters haven't received model updates since their original iterations four years ago in the first core set. And AMG has come quite a long way with their sculpting and casting technology since then, so it's really great to see a lot of these classic characters updated for the modern game. This set also seems to include a lot of fun extras that the original set didn't have. You get a ton of tokens and things in this set, and I had a lot of fun organizing them all into this plastic container I got from the dollar store. For my original base set, I went with a pretty standard color scheme, but in this case, I thought it might be fun to see what these Marvel characters could look like in a more dirty, grimy, grimdark style, so I busted out some primers and got started. Day one. For the character models, I decided to prime them using my Black Badger Stino Res Airbrush Primer. But instead of using my airbrush, I have been recently experimenting with using this primer as a brush-on primer. And I've had some pretty good and interesting results using it that way, so that's what I did here. I know a lot of you might look down on using brush-on primers because it can give a somewhat uneven result and can even obscure details in some cases, but as a speed painting tool, I think using an airbrush primer as a brush-on primer can be quite interesting. As when you brush it on, it gathers in the recesses of the model and gives us this sort of contrast effect almost, giving us some built-in shading over a gray midtone. And by using a thin airbrush primer in this way, instead of a typical brush-on primer, it doesn't obscure the details in that usual way as it's such a thin paint. Some of you might be skeptical of this approach and be worried that this isn't enough of a prime for these models, that the paint won't stick to it or that it will scrape or rub off but I've been experimenting with this for a few months now, and so far I haven't had any issues with paint flaking or rubbing off using this method. I think this is an especially accessible way to prime for beginner painters, as it not only gives you a small amount of pre-shading, but it also doesn't require an airbrush, spray can, or well-ventilated area, which I know from experience, for some people that's going to make a huge difference. You just slap this primer on as you would a contrast paint, let it seep into the recesses, and you're ready to start painting your figure pretty much immediately. But unfortunately, we can't start painting right away as we first have to prime both the terrain and the measuring tools. Although it isn't entirely necessary to paint your measuring tools for games like this, when I see gray plastic, I feel a compulsion to paint it. So for the measuring tools, I used the standard Black Magic Craft recipe of 50% Mod Podge and 50% cheap black craft paint. Just because I don't want to waste any of my expensive primer on this stuff, and I also want a slightly more rigid base coat for the movement tools especially. I primed all of the measuring tools with about two coats of this mixture until they were a solid matte black, 
And for the terrain, I wanted that grimdark look that I've been talking about. And when I think of grimdark terrain, I think excess texture. So I combined my Mod Podge and black paint mixture with some rocks, sand, and gravel from my backyard to create this slightly gross looking composite of dirt and paint. And I then proceeded to slop this stuff onto all of the terrain pieces. In places where I wanted larger pieces of rocks and gravel, I used a large craft stick as a sort of shovel. And I had quite a lot of fun making a huge mess and making all of the terrain look very dirty and grimy using this mixture. On some of the smoother surfaces where I wanted to add a little bit more texture, I found it helped to use a dabbing motion instead of a brushing motion. And I also used this mixture to prime the bases of the character models as I thought some of them could use a little bit of extra grime and texture. I even added a small amount of this mixture to some of the models themselves in places like the cloaks and other cloth areas where I thought a little bit of excess texture would look cool and grimdark. All in all, this priming took me a single night to do, about three or four hours total, so I'm going to count this as my first day of painting. Day two. I let the Mod Podge dry for almost a full 24 hours after this before starting to apply color. And for the base colors on the terrain, I decided to use a few colors of cheap craft paint as I don't really see any reason to use up my expensive paints when painting over such large areas. To start out, I base coated all the areas I wanted to be concrete using a light warm gray. I tried my best to capture all of the details by starting out dabbing the paint on like a sponge and then when the paint on my brush started to run out, I used the remainder to do some dry brushing to capture some of the textured details on parts that I wanted to be gray. While I was at it, I also used this gray dry brush on areas I just wanted to be black, like the street lights, barrels, and the black parts of the front loaders, and I think this worked pretty well. For variety and extra highlights, I used this tan color in a few places on top of the gray. Again, using a dabbing motion to sort of sponge the color on. And once again, when the paint on my brush started to run out, I once again used the remainder to do some dry brushing on various pieces of terrain to add some variety and interest. I used the same concrete recipe to paint all of the movement tools as I thought this might give my set of game pieces a more grimdark, brutalist look. And speaking of the grimdark look, I will be mostly relying on black, gray, white, and neutral or desaturated colors for this paint scheme. However, I did want to pick out a few bright colors to help accent this, and one of those colors is McDonald's Yellow. Also known as Construction Vehicle Yellow, New York Taxi Yellow, and Streetlight Yellow. So I base coated all of these things using this color, using a mostly sponging motion as I did with the concretes. Unfortunately, once this color had dried, it wasn't nearly as striking as I wanted it to be. So I'll have to go over it again later with some higher quality yellow paint. But you know what is exactly as striking as I wanted it to be? My website, which I was able to build quickly and easily using this video's sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace is the all-in-one website and hosting platform that I've been using for over a decade now for all of my website needs. You just pick a template that looks good to you, add in any extra pages or widgets you might like, and customize things to your heart's content using their extremely intuitive drag and drop grid system. No coding or technical knowledge required. I've been using my current Squarespace website for over a year now to host a gallery of my painted miniatures, all of my nice painting reference documents, which you might find useful, as well as a store where I can sell anything I might want. So if you want to make a website, why not check out squarespace.com today for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash Dana Howell for 10% off your very first purchase of a website. 
or domain. Back to painting, I also used just a bit of this yellow color to dry brush some areas of the concrete very, very lightly, just to add some variety of color in places. And for the dumpsters, I sponged on a mixture of brown and yellow to give them a sort of old and rusty look. I also used this brown in a few other places to give the impression of dirt, rubble or dust on the various terrain pieces. And with most of the base coating complete that I was able to achieve with cheap craft paints at least, it was time to move on to using some real paints to base coat the character models. A3. And in order to do this, we're going to use some brand new paints that I just purchased from the hobby store this week, the Pro Acryls starter set from Monument Hobbies. I've heard a lot of good things about these paints, so I thought this would be a good chance to test them out. And one of the first things I noticed about these Pro Acryl paints is that even though they are quite thin, the coverage is absurdly good. And for most colors, only a single coat is required. Very nice. To start out, I base coated all of the exposed skin and all of the parts of the figures that I will eventually want to be the color red with mahogany. I chose this color because it's a nice warm brown color with a slightly reddish tinge to it that will work great as a base tone for all kinds of different warm colors. When using this paint, I dipped my brush into the paint, wiped off almost all of the moisture on a paper towel, and then ran the brush over the parts I wanted to be this color, making sure to leave lots of black in the recesses. I like to think of this technique as somewhere between a really heavy dry brush and edge highlighting. While doing this, we want the paint on our brush to be as dry as possible without being in that dry brush territory so that we have as much control as possible to just paint the raised areas of the model. And unless I say otherwise, this is the painting technique that I'm using for all colors going forward for the character models in this tutorial. I followed this up by using tan flesh to coat all of the exposed skin on the figures using that same technique that we just used, making sure to leave lots of mahogany visible in the shadows. And in most cases, it required two coats of this color to get the color I was looking for. After this, for several of the characters, I felt that some additional shading was necessary on the skin. So I took just a tiny amount of mahogany on my brush, wiped off most of it on a paper towel, but this time, instead of using a dry paper towel, I used a damp paper towel. And you can see how now we can use this paint as a sort of glaze to just apply subtle transparent layers of this color onto the parts of the models where we want it. I had a ton of fun with this technique, especially on crossbones muscles. And unlike everything else in this tutorial, I'm not sure this specific technique would be possible with a cheaper acrylic version of this color. So if you were thinking of purchasing just one paint from this paint line, I think my top recommendation, at least for painting in this sort of grim dark style, would be Pro Acryl Mahogany. After this, in some cases, I added another layer of skin highlights where the glaze made things a little bit too dark in places. And I sometimes even blended the two colors together on top of the model itself to make things look a little bit more natural. With all of the skin complete, I then added highlights to all of the red parts of the models. I used the color Burnt Red for this, once again using the same method I used to paint the skin, wiping off the moisture on a paper towel and applying the color to only the most raised parts of the model to make sure to leave lots of mahogany visible in the recesses. In most cases, I just use a single coat of this color, but in cases where I wanted a slightly brighter red, I sometimes applied two coats, and I especially had a lot of fun with this on Ultron's cape, where I was able to feather the color out in several layers using a rough motion with my brush to create this textured feeling on the cloth. Finally, on a few of the models where I wanted an even brighter red color, I took some bold pyrrole red and added a final highlight, just adding a touch of this color to the parts of the models that I thought would catch the most light. Day four. 
Moving on, let's talk about how I painted the yellow and orange parts of these models. I started with a base coat of magenta, and once that was dry, I added a thinned down coat of burnt red on top of the magenta, using it as a kind of wash to push the intensity of the magenta a little bit higher. And I then added highlights on top of this, first with orange and then with a golden yellow on top of that. And that's pretty much it. That's how I paint yellow. Speaking of orange, I painted all the glowy bits on both Ultron and the Ultron drones by using some orange paint and just letting it drip into the recesses of the areas where I wanted the glow to come from. I wasn't too precise with this as I figured any orange outside the lines would just look like an overspilled light coming from within. And once this was dry, I then added a little bit of yellow onto these glowing bits in the same way to help intensify this effect. Finally, once that was dry, I added yet another thin coat of orange to add another layer of intensity and bring things back into less of a yellow and more of an orange range. And moving on around the color wheel, let's talk about green. There's only one character in this box who has green on his outfit, so I figured I would do that now. But instead of going with a bright green as I did on my previous version of this character, to go along with our grimdark color scheme, I thought I would paint any bright cool colors in a darker, more desaturated way when possible. So I went with this color, camo green, which is exactly what it sounds like. I applied a thin down wash of dark umber on top of this to make it look a little bit more desaturated and a little bit more worn and dirty. I then did the same thing with any of the characters who had blue or purple on their outfits, applying just a single coat of a darker, more desaturated blue or purple, and then applying a thin down coat of dark umber on top of that to help desaturate the color a bit further and add the impression of dirt, grime, and shading. While I had this color on my palette, I also used it to base coat any parts of the models that I would want to eventually be brown, blonde, gold, or white. And once this was dry, I painted all of the blonde parts with golden brown, all of the white parts with a bright warm gray, and then I applied shading to these parts using the same technique as I did with everyone's skin. Thinning down my new favorite color, Proacryl Mahogany, and using it to glaze on any shadows as needed. For Captain America, some parts of his outfit were supposed to be white, but I thought that didn't entirely fit the tone of this paint scheme. So instead, I went for a metallic gray look, painting on dots of bright warm gray onto the parts of his costume that are usually white, and then glazing over them with a coat of dark warm gray to give the impression that he's wearing chain mail or scale mail or something in those areas. Beyond this, there were a ton of models that had large portions of black or gray fabric to paint. And for almost all of this, I just used dark warm gray to highlight it using the same technique as before, wiping off the moisture on my brush and quickly feathering on the highlights. I used more of this gray paint in places where I wanted the fabric to look more gray than black for variety's sake and I glazed on some black paint on top of these highlights in areas that I wanted to look more black than gray. In places where I wanted even more intense highlights, I mixed a small amount of bright warm gray into the dark warm gray to give a second layer of more intense highlights. Once again, feathering these on and embracing the rough texture. Beyond this, I still wanted a bit of variety within all of the black and gray tones on the models, so I mixed together a 50-50 mix of Proacryl Jade and Black with some water to create a glaze. And I then applied this over top of several of the models in certain places to shift their warm black clothing into more of a cool black clothing range. For Spider-Man's webbing, I base coated it in a bright warm gray and then applied this same glaze of Jade and Black to it to add a little bit of shading. Beyond this, I glazed on more of mahogany onto some of the models in places where I wanted either some more shading or more rust or more of a warm, dirty look. And for everyone's bases, I used a base coat of dark warm gray, a highlight of bright warm gray, and then I followed up with a glaze of dark umber to give the concrete a slightly dirtier, but also a slightly more 
yellowish look, which is what I think of when I think of concrete sidewalks. I substituted mahogany for dark umber on some of the bases for variety, and also to paint the rusted metal on those bases. For the explosion or rocket effects on the bases, I started out by base coating them in titanium white, and then applying an overall coat of yellow on top of these areas. I then applied some orange to just the most external parts of the blast area, and for Ultron specifically, I did a variation on this where I used the same technique, but then applied some dark gray to just the most extreme raised areas and outer areas of the explosion to look like smoke or debris. I then added a few warm light gray highlights to this to help blend it in with the rest of the base, and I finished it all up with some mahogany glazing to make everything nice and grimy. After this, I took a break from painting the figures to work on the terrain and I basically used the same techniques here that I used on the figures. I used a mixture of yellow and orange to repaint a lot of the construction vehicles and other yellow things to give them a more vibrant look, in some cases applying an undercoat of white underneath first to get an even brighter yellow, and inspired by the gas station that I grew up with, Petro Canada, I decided to paint the gas station in a red color scheme. I then applied some mahogany to a few of the other cars and dumpsters to give a nice rusty look, and I then spent way more time than was necessary adding hand-painted details to the gas pump based on photos of actual gas pumps. I then painted the Roxxon sign using bright warm grey to outline the red lettering and applied a little bit of weathering at the same time. For the traffic lights, I used some black paint to clean up a few of the details. I painted the top two lights in red the bottom one in camo green, and I then added a coat of yellow over top of the middle light to create a sort of amber look. I then carefully painted the you can walk person onto the sign using white paint, while at the same time also painting a few other details and highlights in white as well. I also realized at this point that the green light wasn't quite bright enough, so I broke my color scheme a little bit and painted it in white, followed up by a coat of brighter green, which I also painted in a larger area around the light to make it look more like a light source. I then used a very small brush to paint on the impression of a sign with writing above the crosswalk button, and then cleaned up a few more areas with this black color, adding some weathering while I was at it, and once this was done, I added a glaze of mahogany over several areas to add the kind of rust and grime I want this whole set of terrain to have. After this, I moved on to the construction vehicles, adding mahogany grime to them as well, using both a stippling technique to add larger patches of rust, as well as a dry brushing technique to pick up all of the texture that we got from our primer on these machines to turn all of that texture into rust and dirt. I applied these techniques of mahogany grime to much of the other terrain as well at this point, adding rust, dirt, and weathering with just this single color. In returning back to the character models, I had just a few more things left to do, and one of those things was the metallics. When I started out this project, I was planning on using true metallics, but I changed my mind last minute and went with some simple non-metallic metals instead. For the silvers, I kept it pretty simple using that same not quite a dry brush, not quite an edge highlight technique to pick out all of the highlights on the metal at first, starting with about a 50-50 mix of dark warm gray and light warm gray. I then added successive amounts of bright warm gray into that mixture and highlighted it up using the layering technique from there. On Ultron specifically, I felt like the metals needed some dark shadows for contrast with the inner glow, so I went in with my smallest brush and added some panel lining with a black paint, especially around those glowy bits to help them read better as glowing. I then finished up all the silver metallics with a glaze of mahogany once again to add some weathering and shading. For the gold metallics, I used a base coat of golden brown over the areas that I had already painted in dark umber. And then once this paint was fully dry, I once again added an overall glaze of mahogany to give us some warmer shadows. I then cleaned off my brush and used my empty brush to remove a lot of this mahogany glaze in the areas where I wanted bright highlights. And that's pretty much it. This is what I was able to accomplish over the course of 24, maybe closer to 26 or 28 hours. <laughs> 
over the course of a seven day week. It's definitely not perfect. I definitely wish I had more time to add more details and especially more highlights to all of the models. And I might go off and do that in my own time, but I can't describe the incredible feeling that it gives me to have a fully painted starter set of a game that is ready to play with within such a short time after receiving the initial box. And if you, like me, have trouble finishing things, I highly recommend doing a challenge like this. It was really incredible to see what I could get done with a timer like this. I hope you got something interesting out of this video. And if you did, I would highly recommend checking out my Patreon, which is really the only reason I am able to do these longer, more in-depth tutorial videos because the YouTube algorithm sure doesn't reward this sort of behavior. Thank you so much as always to all of our generous patrons. And this week I would especially like to thank ECB22 for all of their wonderful contributions over the past few months. So thank you very much for that. As always, thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next video.